So what, what should you do if you are worried about uh, fire sales? Um, Anson and Kashyap and Stein recently suggested that um, you should try to ask for recapitalizations and basically make sure when a bank or insurance company is in trouble and doesn't sell, satisfy the solvency ratio, it prefers raising new equity rather than selling assets because that prevents fire sales. And they say it has an extra advantage because you know issuing equity is not very easy. I mean, there is a very strong adverse selection issue. Actually, the stock market reaction can be negative when you issue equity. Um, so um, the idea is that if you are forced by the regulator, the adverse selection problem is, is, is not as pregnant and therefore um, it's not dramatic. So you should pre privilege, you should favor recapitalization over asset sales as a way of reestablishing capital solvency. There are possibilities to have the market, uh, to jumpstart the market, and um, uh, the idea is that uh, the government intervenes and buys some assets or guarantees interbank loans or takes toxic assets as collateral, recapitalizes, nationalizes, I mean, basically puts mon government money into the thing. Um, it's, it's, costly, um, it's costly if it's successful because, you know, if you want to restart a market, uh, basically you have to clean up the bad assets. So the better assets remain in the market, so the market rebounds, but of course, if if you anticipate that, you should realize that you should not sell your asset to the government now. You should wait and get uh, take advantage of the market rebound. And so in the end, it's going to be costly for the government, which doesn't mean it's going to be suboptimal. It's just going to be costly because you really have to pay the price you have to pay. And we have seen in Japan in the 90s exactly that. And it, we have seen that more recently in the crisis, which is that uh, when the government tries to intervene, uh, basically, the banks tend to say, no, 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 I'm in good health. I'm not going to participate in a scheme. And there's this kind of waiting game that lasted 10 years in Japan uh, before, the, maybe not 10 years, but quite a long time before the government finally was able to buy, buy the assets. Something we have seen quite a lot in the last crisis, a widespread maturity mismatch. Okay, so basically lots of financial institutions uh, borrowing short term and taking a gamble on the short term interest rate. Because when you borrow short term, like a month or six months, you have to roll it over. And if the interest rate goes up, you're in big trouble. So it's like a gamble. Now, as long as the rate of interest is zero or one percent or even negative, as it is now in real terms, this is a very good deal, right? You know, your cost of capital is very, very low. But if it goes up to 5%, you're in big trouble. So borrowing short term is actually a gamble, okay? It can be a very profitable gamble. As long as it lasts, it's fantastic. But here is the interesting thing. Imagine that lots of financial institutions do that. Not one, but lots of financial institutions do that. And they adopt a very liquid balance sheet. They, they, borrow, they borrow short term. Um, and they take correlated risk on top of that. So imagine, for example, they are all exposed to a bubble. So it's perfect correlation in a sense because if the bubble bursts, it's going to burst for all of them. Um, then, basically, the authorities have no choice but engaging in what I would call triple play bailouts. The first thing is the monetary bailout. So, uh, by the way, when you talk to central banks, you talk to them about monetary bailouts, they say, monetary bailouts? What do you mean? <laughs> and, you know, just you lower the rate of interest. It's a subsidy. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying it's a bad one, but it's a subsidy from people who save, you and me, uh, to the, the, the people who borrow, right? Now, I would argue there is no issue that you have got to do that. It's a standard policy. It has been the standard policy for 60 years, 80 years, I don't know. You know, when your financial system is in trouble, you have no choice but lowering rates of interest so that they rebuild uh, capital adequacy. That's completely clear. But this is a bailout. This is not a, a bailout because it transfers resources from savers to borrowers. 
Second bailout accounting, you reclassify, you abandon market value accounting, and you say now we are going for historical cost accounting, at least for some assets. And then fiscal policies, fiscal in court, because we no longer know what fiscal policy is. The ECB and the Fed have done a lot of fiscal policy, right? They, they accept low quality collateral, and then the Treasury will do equity injections, loan guarantees, and so on. And that means that, you know, the, ba the basic part is lots of institutions play short -term, the, the short-term debt game. And they have trouble at the same time because they have taken quality positions. Then the central bank is stuck. It has no choice and it has to lower rates of interest. Just to give you an analogy, you know, let's say there is a new airport in Barcelona, okay, in some remote area in Barcelona. And then you built your house net next to the airport. Well, you're in big trouble if you are the only one to do it because the airport will expand, right? And you'll have more and more noise. But if all of us in this room go and build a house next to the airport, then the airport is in big trouble, right? And it's the same thing with the central bank. If, if lots of financial institutions take a gamble on the short-term interest rate, the central bank is completely stuck. Okay. Now, what you have got to do then is to regulate liquidity. It's not easy, by the way. I mean, we could have a discussion of that. It's it's very technical. It's extremely difficult to regulate li liquidity. Basel III is trying to do some of that, but with an eye on the entire financial system. So it's it doesn't suffice to look at the liquidity of one bank. You also have to look at the liquidity of all the players, because then that, that will condition your policy later, tomorrow. Fifth item, a pro-cyclicity of Basel, Basel, Basel one and two, actually, I should say. Uh, Basel one was already pro-cyclical in some way. I mean, if you, if you lose revenue, then you lose capital. You have, you have to reduce the size if you, you know, unless you can raise a lot of equity, but otherwise you have to reduce the size and you get a credit crunch. And that's something which is, in a sense, pro-cyclical. So Basel II, with the market value accounting, but anyway, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not against market value accounting. It has a lot of virtues. And if you go back to Japan in the 90s, you understand why you might, you might want to have some market value accounting. But um, that adds to it. That adds to, to the cyclicity of regulation. Because you know, if you do well, you know, you, if you make money, you know, asset go, the price of your assets go up, you have more capital, you can invest more. Uh, and if you do poorly, you're in big trouble because then you, you have to invest less. Now, market value accounting, I think we have to keep. I mean, there's no way out. Um, you may want to think about the institutions with long-term liabilities. You may not want them to, to have their capital adequacy ratio to fluctuate too much with short-term values. And also, you have to think, of course, about the exit price, which is what matters, uh, just take real estate. Uh, what matters is not the, the value today. So for example, when you make a loan to a to household, so you make some mortgage to a household, and you take the house as collateral, what matters is not the house today, the value of the house today, it's the value of the house tomorrow in the state of nature where you seize the house. And in, in general, it's pretty correlated with other things on your balance sheet. And that's what has to be thought about. Okay, so um, the exit value, the exit price is is actually it's kind of subjective, of course, because you have to anticipate how much money you will get if you see the house in that state of nature. But that's a relevant economic relevant uh, variables. I've long been in favor of concert cyclical capital buffers. That's a theory. In practice, it's much harder, and I don't have any good recipe. Um, but the Basel Committee has proposed to look at deviations of uh, credit to GDP ratio from trends. So if there's a lot of credit relative to GDP, there's excess credit growth, and then you, it's like a flag. It's a warning. Um, Rafael Repullo just and others have mentioned that, uh, unfortunately, the credit GDP gap uh, sometimes is negatively correlated with the business cut cycle, not always. But I mean, you saw that very, very easily in 2008. In 2008, we were in big trouble. And actually, the banks, I don't know about Spain, but in the US actually granted more credits 
precisely when they were in trouble. Why? I mean, one of the very simple reasons is that there were lots of credit lines. Credit lines usually are not drawn, except when things go wrong, right? So all the firms rush to uh, draw on their credit lines. So actually, the banks actually granted more credit when they were in trouble. So it's actually kind of um, kind of difficult, and um, you know any ideas that you will have on this front, and you know again I haven't thought very much about it, but any ideas that you'll have on on this front, so as to have uh, proper countercyclical capital buffers, will be very useful. There are uh, possibility of cross exposures and contagion, the, domi the famous domino effects, which thanks to them we had the Bear Stearns and Lehman and AIG and. I don't know, many other things. So the culprit there, as you know, is the over-the-counter markets. We didn't have to rescue AIG or Lehman. I mean, Lehman, we didn't, but um, or Bear Stearns or others, investment banks. We don't have to rescue hedge funds. We don't have to rescue all kinds of unregulated entities. After all, they don't have retail depositors. They don't have insurance. And um, the reason why we rescue them is that we're very worried about what will happen if they go bust, what will happen to the financial system. We're worried about the market freezing and the domino effects. Now, something I found very shocking, I must say, about the recent crisis is the fact that the US government, and I'm very grateful to them, by the way, uh, as, as being a European, uh, rescued um, Entities like AIG and so on, entities they were not regulated. Do you know? How, do you know, by the way, how many regulators were regulating the investment banks? The five big investment banks: Goldman Sachs and so on. Seven. Um, they wrote something actually, which was put immediately in an, into a drawer. Um, but by and large, are unregulated institutions, and they have access to taxpayer money. It's one thing to be regulated, to be supervised, and say, so, you know, if things go wrong. You know, I, I will be bailed out by the government. I mean, if if it's a big shock and it's not completely my fault, but to have all those big unregulated entities being able to borrow close to the time where where they were going bankrupt and also to to, to give dividends <laughs> to their shareholders, all that with taxpayer money is is really a big scandal. And and the reason for that is really that they were counting on being rescued. Right? And the standard too big, too interconnected to fail, kind of thing. So I think there, there is no issue. We have to move to what, and that's what Basel III is doing to some extent. We'll see how they implement it. To what central clearing counterparties so that we, we know how much wolves what. By the way, when you rescue AIG, uh, because you are afraid that your commercial banks will go, or insurance companies will go bankrupt, could just say AIG will go bankrupt and I just rescue a couple of, uh, of banks. But usually you don't know where the liabilities are, you don't know what's going to happen in bankruptcy. But in any case, there, there, is, there is an issue of accountability there and I think we, we have to change. Over the counter market are perfectly fine markets, you know, they allow us to complete markets and so on and so forth and need not be inefficient but not when you play with the taxpayer money, and that's really what happened. Um, so there should be higher, much higher capital adequacy requirement on those, and we should be using whenever possible, because I think m the argument, the economist argument that we are completing markets is, is really too much. I think we can do a lot by just having a number of markets on interest rate swaps and, and foreign exchange swaps and whatnot, so that you can get insurance, maybe some CDS, so that you can get insurance on a number of dimensions. And you, know, you don't need an insurance which is so finely tailored that you have only three people in the world who can understand what this contract means. I think that's three really too much. Um, Maybe a bit controversial, but you know, it's, I think uh, there's an issue there.